Welcome to this service of worship on this Thanksgiving Sunday and also Methodist Justice Ministry Sunday, and you'll learn more about that a little later in the worship service. So glad that you're here. If you're guests with us, especially we welcome you, and on behalf of the whole church, I extend a First Church welcome to you, and we're glad that you're worshiping with us. Now let us prepare our hearts and our minds for worship. for our call to worship. With what shall I come before the Lord and, how, and, and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression? the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul.
As we remain standing, I invite you to turn back to your bulletin so that we can affirm our faith together. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God, who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the Church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Baptism is always a sacred moment in the life of the church and in the life of a family. Today, it is our very special joy to invite the Beacon family forward for the baptism of their son. Beloved of God, baptism is a sign to us of the mercy and grace of God. It is a sacrament indicating that we do not come into relationship with God on the basis of anything that we do or anything that we are, but simply on God's acceptance and gracious invitation to us. Infant baptism is an especially appropriate demonstration of this grace, for Jesus said, Let the children come to me, do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. I'm going to ask you now, as you stand before God in this congregation, do you affirm your faith in Christ? And do you promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, all nations, and all races? And will you nurture Christopher William and Christ's holy church, that by your teaching and guidance, he will be guided to accept God's grace for himself, to profess his faith openly, and to lead a Christian life? <laughs> Christopher William, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Now if you'll place your hands on him also. Christopher William, the Holy Spirit work within you, that being born of water and the Spirit, you will remain a faithful disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You like that. Oh, what a blessing it is to participate in this holy sacrament of baptism, that we have an opportunity as Christopher Williams Church family to pledge ourselves along with his parents to do all that we can to help nurture him in the Christian faith so that as he grows up among us, he'll come to the place in his life where he'll stand at this or some other altar and make his own profession of faith in Christ. And all this is God's wonderful gift offered to us without price. Say hello, everybody. You lost a tooth. I see that. Now, as Christopher's church family, would you please 
join me in the congregational response to baptism. With God's help, we will so order our lives after the example of Christ that Christopher William, surrounded by steadfast love, may be established in the faith and confirmed and strengthened in the way that leads to life eternal. I'd like to invite the children to come down for our time together. Kids, come on. going to have new room on one side this time. Got it? Come on, Josh, keep going. We're almost there. We're almost there. But this is an RPU. All right. Good. Hey, good morning. How are you? Good to see you. Okay. Oh, here she comes. All right. Well, you know, Jesus gives a special commandment for us to love one another just as Jesus loves us. But what does that mean exactly? Well, it just so happens, everybody say, hey, Mr. Mark, that sure is a nice bracelet. Well, thank you very much. So, and you know, it says something. It, it's a reminder of what would a First United Methodist Fort Worth, Texas kid do? Or W-W-A-F-U-M-C-F-W-T-K-D for short. So let's imagine what would one of us do? What would one of us as a child at First Methodist do so that we can show love for one another just as Jesus loves us? And you know what this means, obviously. It's time to get into our time machines. So everybody get in your time machines, put on your helmets, and we're going to set for tomorrow morning. Ready? Here we go. Let's go. Let's count down from five. Here we go. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, time travel to the next day does not take very long. So here we are, it's Monday, and we're in the school, we're at school, and wait a second, no one's here at school. Why is no one at school today? Oh, it's Thanksgiving week, why didn't y'all tell me that? All right, let's get back in our time machines. All right, let's set it for a week from Monday, okay? Do, 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 do. All right, ready? Let's count back down from five, four, three, two, one. Here we go, five, four, three, two, one. <sighs> Anybody sick at their stomach? Sometimes time travel can, you know. All right, we good? All right. So here we are. It's Monday, and a brand new kid has come to join our class, but it doesn't look like there's any room. What would a kid from First Methodist do? What would they do? What, would, what do you think? What's that? What do you think? Make friends with them, and would we just say, well, sorry, there's nowhere to sit. Can't sit here. We'd make some room, right? Let's all scooch a little bit. Let's all scooch and make a little bit of room. You know, it's one of those simple things in the whole world is to make room for people. That's one of the easiest things to do, but sometimes the older we get, we think, oh, there's not room for more. There's always room for more. Okay, let's imagine it's at lunch and our new friend who we've just met has got peanut butter and jelly all over their face and they don't have a napkin what, but we have an extra napkin. What would we do? What would a kid from First Methodist do? Share the napkin. Okay, but uh, here's a tricky one. What if we've only got the one napkin? What, what would we do? You, you could split it. Oh, you're good. <laughs> wow. You could split the two napkins and give one what, to one sh and the other side the other person. And you could each have a part. That's exactly what, so when we're showing love for one another, we're, th we're not thinking about problems, we're thinking about solutions. Okay, so let's imagine, let's not just imagine because we're here, so watch my hands when I do this. We're all going to stand up, 
So watch carefully and okay, we're gonna play soccer, but first we gotta stretch. Well, when you're me, you've got to stretch. All right, and we're playing soccer and we're moving and we're dribbling and we're shooting and we look and our new friend who plays for the, he's on the other team, has fallen and he's hurt. But everybody else has run off and is playing and giggling. What, well, what should we do? Go, go, help, go help that friend. Okay, but remember, this friend is playing on the other team. Still? Still help that person up? I think it's a good idea. Let's reach down and let's help up. Oh, give that friend a nice pat on the back. Oh, sorry. He, you made him burp. You patted him too hard. All right. And give him a big hug. Let's give him a big hug. That's a great idea. All right. Say bye to your new friend. Say, I'll see you, I'll see you next week. Because we got to go back to now. So get back in our, in our time, in our time ships. Go have a seat. All right, let's set it back for 11.15 on November 22nd. Ready? Here we go. Two, 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 two. And five, four, three, two, one. You know what? Say what, Mr. Mark? I think those are all wonderful ideas. So maybe one of the best ways is to show love for one another is just to stop and think. What would a First United Methodist Church Fort Worth, Texas kid do? And if you can think about that and then do it, I think you'll be on the right track. Let's have a prayer. Repeat after me. Dear God, thank you so much for your son Jesus and his commandment to love one another just the way he loves us. We are thankful for him. We're thankful for everyone in this room. We're thankful for you. Amen. Have a happy Thanksgiving.
Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning again. I want once again to welcome you to this service of worship, especially if you're guests with us today on behalf of the whole church. I welcome you. I want to ask you all to take a moment and tear off the flap on the right-hand side of the bulletin. At the, the top part of that, it goes in the offering plate after you've filled it out to register your attendance. And then the bottom part of that has some important dates coming up. Uh, we begin the season of Advent next Sunday, and leading up to the events in the season of Advent and throughout the season, there is a devotional booklet that looks like this called Nativity Scene. And each day there is a devotional. It begins tomorrow morning. Each day a devotional for uh, each day in the season of Advent. And you can find these in the foyer of the sanctuary or in the welcome center or in the church office. You can pick one of these up this morning to guide you in your devotionals throughout the season of Advent. And so I hope you will do that. And certainly feel free to pick up an extra one or two and share it with others so that they can participate in this way throughout the season. Um, also, let me remind you that the Parade of Lights downtown Fort Worth has moved this year to this evening. It has been in the past, the day after Thanksgiving, but it will be this evening. And our youth, as a special fundraiser for missions, is, is allowing people to park on the parking lots and charging uh, for that uh, parking in order to raise funds. So if you're planning to attend the Parade of Lights this evening, please park in the parking lots here and support our youth as you also enjoy the, the Parade of Lights this evening. Today is Justice, Methodist Justice Ministry Sunday as well, as I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> and today we celebrate. We celebrate this important ministry, 10 years of this ministry. We celebrate the work of Reverend Brooks Harrington, the founder of the Methodist Just, Justice Ministries. Uh, most of you know Brooks. Brooks is... Uh, a, not only a native of Fort Worth, but grew up in this church. And Brooks is an ordained United Methodist pastor and also an attorney and the founder and the leader of the Methodist Justice Ministry, which does such great work. 1,027 women and children have been helped by this ministry during these last 10 years. The motto of the justice ministry is a passage of scripture, and it is from the book of Proverbs. Speak out for those who cannot speak, for the rights of all the destitute. Speak out, judge righteously, and defend the rights of the poor and the needy. And that's what the Methodist justice ministry has done, representing women and children who are abused and who are not able to afford Legal, uh, legal representation and other services. So the Methodist Justice Ministry through all these years has helped to get uh, protection orders, enforce those orders, uh, to fight for the rights of the women and children in every respect, uh, for custody, for denial or restriction, uh, restriction of, uh, of visitation by abusers, uh, child support, medical support, uh, help, emergency uh, financial aid to help in, in, um, uh, with, with housing or food or other needs. The needs are great, and this ministry has done such great work through all these years. Much like our First Street Methodist Mission, the Methodist Justice Ministry relies on support from individuals and foundations within our congregation in our community uh, for the ministry. The church provides the space for the justice ministry, provides accounting services, provides uh, the, um, uh, for uh, help with fundraising and communications. But the real support of the justice ministry relies on second mile giving, on the gifts that you and I give, and people in our community, and as I said, foundations as well. So our celebration this morning is, has a twofold purpose. One is to celebrate the ministry, to raise awareness of the ministry, but also to help raise funds uh, to support this ministry. The needs are great. Brooks will say more about that in a moment in his, in his sermon. 
but the needs are great and growing. And so it's important that we provide support uh, for this ministry. There is a tent that is set up outside and following the service. I encourage you to visit that tent to learn more about the ministry, to have an opportunity to contribute, to be put on a mailing list, uh, to receive updates from the ministry, and also to receive, it doesn't say, what would the children of First United Methodist Church do, but it is a Methodist Justice Ministry bracelet that reminds us of this important ministry. Brooks, thank you for all you do and for the people. <clears throat> And I know you'll say it too in a moment, but for all those other people who work with you and alongside of you um, to make the ministry possible. Now I invite our ushers to come forward as we receive our tithes and our offerings. with thanksgiving that we bow in prayer, giving you thanks, O God, for all your blessings. And even as we give thanks and are mindful of the blessings that we enjoy, we are mindful of those who are in need, particularly for women and children this morning on this Methodist Justice Ministry Sunday. We pray, O God, that these gifts that are generously given would be multiplied and used for the glory of your kingdom, for the sake of your people. In Jesus' name, amen.
Holy God, each of us needs all of you. We need you in your full, fullness as a creative father, a redeeming son, and a sustaining spirit. Each of our lives has its own complications and its own pain, and of course our world is torn by violence and hatred. We see suffering in our own hearts, in our neighborhoods, and in images from cities and countries far from here. We see and feel fear and uncertainty and sadness. All of it hurts. But we were made in your image, God, and your spirit was breathed into us that we might experience hope in your love and grace. In the midst of situations that could blind us to your goodness and to the love between your children, tune us in to the beauty shining through the brokenness. Open our eyes to evidence of goodwill and friendship. Fill us with a spirit of generosity and patience. Tune our ears to listen to the needs of our neighbors near and far, and give us strength to rise to meet those needs. In this season of Thanksgiving, may we stand in gratitude, remembering warmly and humbly all that is beautiful in our lives and in the world. Slow us down to recognize the true heroes in our midst, the people who show us how to love extravagantly, the people who are trying to bring healing to pain, the people who have loved as you first loved, may we love as you love. And in the spirit of love and unity, we join our voices together now, praying the words Christ Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Today's scripture reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verses 12 through 17. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer, because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends, because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my Father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I'm giving you these commands so that you may love one another. God speaks to us through the reading of Scripture. Thanks be to God. I'd like you all to recall for just a second how you felt few moments ago when you saw those beautiful children here. Memory is actually a recalling of our emotional and mental state at the time. It wasn't very long ago. Recall, because there were smiles on all your faces. There's a mom back there. I don't mean to embarrass her with a newborn rocking that child. So much love and nurture, children are so vulnerable, so dependent, and so precious. And not just my child or my grandchild, but all children. The soul of justice 
the beginning of God's justice is to recognize and to feel in our hearts that not only does God love me infinitely and love mine infinitely, but God loves everyone and particularly every child just as much. That's the beginning of God's justice. Our middle daughter presented us with a grandchild, our third grandchild, Tuesday night. And yesterday we went over to her place in Dallas. This child is now four days old. And while Maxine was, you know, cleaning and cooking and helping, I was holding the baby. That was really important to do, I thought. <laughs> Ela, he, he, he's so small. Le Levi is so small, so dependent, almost unaware of the world. He's pure life, and he is a pure recipient of love. Our daughter is a heart surgeon. She went to Stanford and played soccer, and then went to Stanford Medical School, and then went to Stanford heart surgery training. Her husband is a businessman who went to Cal Berkeley and who played a professional sport and represented the United States at world championships. We hope to God that child is an athlete. <laughs> but as I was holding that child, our third grandchild, as I was holding that child yesterday at their place in Dallas, I imagined that Levi was another child. I used to, as many of you know, I used to represent doctors in medical malpractice cases before, <clears throat> before Tim allowed me to come here and found this ministry. Tim invited me to come here and found this <laughs> And I have friends still in the medical profession, and I talked to the head of obstetrics at John Peter Smith Hospital and found out that on the same day that Levi was born, which was last Tuesday, a baby was born with what is called neonatal abstinence syndrome. He was born addicted to drugs. He was born addicted to heroin. And his first experience of life is the pain, because it is painful, of withdrawing from heroin. He'll have to remain in the hospital for two to four weeks on methadone, a newborn. And as I held my grandson, Levi, I pictured that little boy for a while. If we don't recognize that life is unfair, we're fools. We're fools in the biblical sense. We don't look at other people besides ourselves. 25,000 to 30,000 children a day die in this world from the effects of poverty. Hunger or bad water, malnutrition, or diseases that would be easily treated by the simplest vaccinations in the, in the developed world. And in the Methodist Justice Ministry, daily, daily, we see cases involving children who are born addicted to drugs, and there are children here, so I'm not going to be completely frank, who are abused in the worst kinds of ways, who are neglected, who are shunted from pillar to post, whose mom is an addict or mentally ill, and so often we see those things are combined. And when I compare the possibilities of life for my grandson Levi with those parents and all of the love, I'm sure he'll have his problems. Every child has problems. Every human being has ruts in the road. Every child can go the wrong way. But every resource and every amount of love and understanding will be brought to bear on Levi to get him through it. And yet we see more than daily, children who it seems don't have a chance because of poverty and addiction and abuse and neglect. And for me, because I've never been able to take the advice of putting a distance between myself 
and those children. What kind of person would I be if I did not lose sleep? The question is always, is this a just world? And for a believer like myself, and I, I'm sure for all of you, the question is, is God just? And the answer of Scripture, from the beginning of the Hebrew Scriptures to the end of the Greek Scriptures, from the first verse of Genesis to the last verse of, of Re Revelation, is that God is just and God is merciful. That God's justice is part and parcel with mercy. But that that justice and mercy is brought into the world by God in our hearts and minds. In ours. We are the justice and mercy of God. That is our calling. And the calling of the church, the calling of the church, is not great attendance, although that's very nice. Thank you for being here. It's not tithing, although that's very nice. Thank you for doing that. It's not beautiful worship. It's not beautiful music. It's not a beautiful building. The calling of the church is to create and empower people who are just and merciful and who seek out other people's children to help and other people's grandchildren and not just their own. It is so easy to give in to despair and anger, which is my battle. This ministry started 10 years ago, January 1st, and it started off with just me, and then I added Juliana Ipok, who's been with us eight and a half years, and then we added Norma Serrano, who is another legal assistant, and then we added Linda Gregory, who used to be the managing attorney of Legal Aid of Northwest Texas, and who wanted to help people in the name of Christ, and so quit that job and came to this ministry to make about half the money she made before. And all of us have different battles. Mine is a battle with despair and with anger at the miserable kind of treatment of children that we see every day. And I've never been able to create a callus between myself and that. Not just children born with drug addiction, but children who are abused, children who are neglected, children who are beaten, children who are locked in rooms, children, everything that you can imagine happening to these precious children happens to them. And what we do in the justice ministry, as Tim told you, is that we get custody orders and sometimes protective orders and usually put protections for the children inside the custody orders. For instance, the child born addicted will be placed with a relative, hopefully, who will, a grandparent or a great grandparent, or an uncle or an aunt or a brother or sometimes just a friend. There, are, there is in our congregation today, and I'm not going to say anything more about this and embarrass them that there are two sisters here who have a baby with them to whom they are not related, but who took that child in and are protecting and nurturing and loving that child even though they're not related to him out of justice and mercy because the mother was 13 years old when she conceived and 14 years old when she had the child and cannot provide. We get custody orders for people who will protect and nurture the children, but that's just the beginning of it. We get protective orders. We enforce the protective orders, but that's just the beginning of it because the people who we help are already poor or we wouldn't have them. And what we do when we get them custody is we make them poorer. And yet we see a willingness in these economically poor people, and the more doubt, devout they are, the more willing they are, do this, they, they are to do this. The more freely they do it, the, the less it's a chore and the more it's something they want to do. They want to take children not their own in and protect them and nurture them and provide for them. And so that we, when we often make them poor and they, they take the children into a residence that's too small to begin with, we'll often help them get into a larger residence and we'll provide emergency financial support for the rent and for transportation when their car breaks down or when the, they can't pay the electric bills. Or, and we have a licensed professional counselor who helps our, the children who've been abused and the, 
and the parents, the mother who has been a victim of family violence for years because she was so dependent and told she was worthless and so poor that she couldn't get out of that home. But she finally makes the break when she sees her son beginning to imitate the violence that she's been subjected to. And for the sake of her children, she leaves there and has no place to go and no income. And so the beginning of our work is just the protective order. It's to help her find a home. It's to give her some, to help her get education, to help her find a job, to help her for, provide, to, to find child care, to help her with the emergency money, to get her out of that situation, and to help her stay out of that situation, and to get her counseling so that she can deal with her own guilt that she's allowed that to happen to her so long in front of her children. We're not just a law practice, we're a ministry. We get 20 to 25 requests for help every week. And it's just two lawyers and two legal assistants. There's a number that the church has been great in publicizing, the number of women and children who we've helped over the years in court with lawsuits, 1,027. Brothers and sisters, when I look at that number, the only number I see is the children we haven't helped. because we haven't had the resources. And I've worked seven days a week for the last 10 years, almost. And so it's easy to despair. And it's easy for me to give in to anger at these guys. But the saving grace for me, not only for me to continue this work, but also for me to continue to believe in a just and merciful and loving God is all the heroes who I see. Because he in every case, there are heroes. There are the great-grandparents who will take in children, their great-grandchildren, because there's no one else to take it. I had a case with Judge Sinha just two weeks ago, an 81-year-old great-grandmother, great-grandfather, and an 80-year-old grandmother who had taken in a six- and an eight-year-old, two boys, their great-grandsons, their daughter, the grandmother, had died. The mother of the child, the children were mentally ill and drug addicted. And so we got an 81 and an 80 year old legal custody of two children, six and eight. And they went into it knowing exactly what they were doing because they loved those children. And God had put that on their hearts. And Judge Sinha treated them with such respect and support and admiration for what they were doing. In every case we have someone like that. The sisters who are here, I'm not going to call out, it's a pending case before one of these judges, so I can't go any farther than that. But who take a child into their home, a baby into their home, and they're not even related. Carolyn, who was a great-grandmother whose, whose husband has leukemia and who took in five great-grandchildren by all by her granddaughter, by five different men. She's mentally ill and addicted. She takes them in, and she's immediately totally impoverished. She does it with great spirit and great will. And so we help her financially. Every day we give out money, not just to present clients, but to former clients, and are privileged to do so to help people get through it. Norma, who works in my office, Norma Serrano, I wish you'd go by the tent and look at her because when you do, you're seeing an angel. We met her when she was initially our client. She took in five of her nieces and nephews because of the violence and the drug addiction in their home, and she has raised them as their legal custodian for the last five years. Norma sleeps in a sleeping bag on the floor to let the children have the bedrooms. And every time my wife and I give her money, she spends it on the children. She won't buy herself a bed. I'm looking at another hero, but the children are here, so I'm not gonna describe it anymore. Olivia. It's the heroes that we see that keep us going. And they're all around us. There is this distorted view in our culture of who a hero is, is what a hero is. It's the billionaire who says every damn thing, damn fool thing that comes to his mind whenever he does because he's a billionaire. I'm not being too subtle.
It's the football player who can sack the quarterback and treats women terribly, but he's a millionaire. It's the person who, because they've got the money, can buy anything they want, whenever they want it, and do anything they want, they think. It's the CEO who makes million, hundreds of billions of dollars while his employees are making minimum wage. And as a subculture of who heroes are, we see daily young men whose hero is another young man who can get the most young, men, young women pregnant without paying child support. It's distorted. The scripture doesn't mention the word hero one time from the beginning and the end, but that's what it's all about. The ethical teachings of Torah and the prophets, and particularly of our Lord, are about how to be a hero. They're about giving your life for someone else and not being self-conscious about it. They're about losing your life to gain it, losing your life and the welfare of other people and particularly children and vulnerable people. That is the hero, and they're all around us. And as I say, the calling of the church is to create and produce and empower heroes. We have heroes among us. Shirley Kaling is here. Shirley is a licensed professional counselor who, counselors, who counsels most of our children. We have another counselor, Susan Baldalamar, who, who does Spanish-speaking people. She counsels women who have been abused, teenagers who've been abused, women who are dealing with their guilt, women who are afraid, children. She's a hero. She comes into our offices. She doesn't make any money at it, but she's there. They're the worst kinds of cases, and she's there day after day in our offices taking care we have seven family court judges here. Seven family court judges here. And I just didn't invite them here to curry favor with them, though that, that'd be nice. <laughs> we have Judge Jesse Navarez, Judge Jerry Hennigan, Judge Catterton, my good friend, who's retired and who now sits as a senior judge, Judge Mike Sinha, who's the only one who's running for election next time, I'm just saying. Judge Nancy Berger, who's a member of this church, Judge Beth Polis, Judge Judith Wells. I don't know what your vision is of judges. They see more than the public schools do all the ills of our culture come to the family courts. And daily, for years, multiple times every day, they deal with issues of child abuse, and people who are angry and will not admit they've made mistakes, and sexual abuse, and poverty, and addiction, and mental illness, and every one of them are as acts the way I, toward people, the way I described Mike Sinha, described toward my clients last week. Such wisdom, such patience, more than I could ever have applying the law, but in a humane way, treating people with respect. But see, imagine a job where you went to work every day expecting to see people who had made those kind of mistakes and those kind of children who've been hurt and to try to make people make sense of it and to save the children within the law. I've never seen a harder job in the law in 39 years of practice. I've practiced in federal court in Washington, D.C. I've prosecuted murder cases. I've, I've had civil litigation, products liability, medical malpractice defense, contract disputes all over the state of Texas. I have never seen a collection of judges who were more humane and wiser and doing God's work as much as this group. Please stand up. These are CPS caseworkers. And I love all three of them. We have a close relationship with them. Janita Talley, Samantha Rakovich, and Daryl Dave. They refer us cases. We get 70% 70, 70 of our cases from CPS. Imagine a job where a child is abused and they go into those homes and find the places to place the children and then try to work with the parents in order to get them turned around offering them addiction services, counseling, anger management, batter's intervention, 
urging them to do that, and only when they won't do they refer the cases to us. Every day, suffering children. Every day. And they are criminally underpaid. <laughs> they are worth their weight in gold to this community, and they deserve our thanks. And then the last person I want to recognize is Mike Ingram. Mike is a process server, but he has the more dangerous, the most dangerous job here, even more than the caseworkers who go into those homes, because Mike serves the guys who we're suing who have been violent and abusive. He goes and finds them, and he serves them with the suit papers, and he's the best I've ever seen, and he looks better than I've ever seen him right here. <laughs> but he's part of this team. Stand up, Mike. You ask yourself what it would be like in a world without heroes, because that's what all of these people are. They're heroes. You ask yourself what the world would be like without heroes. I'll tell you what it would be like. It would be like a world without God. It would be like a world without the risen Christ. because that's whether, they believe, whether we believe in God or not, whether we believe in the, G in the risen Christ, whether we say the right things, whether we affirm the right creed, God works through people. And God is with everyone who I, whose name I've called and I've called out. And so the greatest thanks is to God. There's another name for these heroes, and we all know it. It's angels. They are angels. Now, at the end of this service, I, I just delighting in this. I'm wearing a robe and you aren't. <laughs> <laughs> but I need to tell you to stand up. <laughs> I want all of the judges and the CPS workers and Shirley and Mike Andrew to come down and stand here. So you can give them your thanks. You've prob many people here have had cases with the judges. Don't bring it up. <laughs> many of you have, may, you may have pending cases with the judges. Don't bring those up for sure. Just thank them. Now, the Cowboys started playing a few minutes ago. We got a choice, brothers and sisters. We can go home and watch the false heroes, or we can stay here and thanks the re thank the real ones. I thank Tim Brewster, my friend, for his support for this ministry. I want to ask all the members of my board to stand up. Just stand up where you are. The world is just. The world is merciful because God is just and God is merciful. Let's be heroes. Let's find a child in need and help her. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, if today is the day that you would like to heroically make a difference as a new member of this church, as we sing our closing hymn, I invite you to come forward. Dr. Brewster and Dr. Lamar Smith will greet you here at the communion rail. They'll enthusiastically welcome you and introduce you to the congregation. With that in mind, let us now stand and raise our voices to God.
Captain Sheffield, who transfers his membership from a United Methodist Church in Allentown, PA. And before he became a member of this church, his son, Henry, was baptized here. So Henry has led his father to the United Methodist Church in Fort Worth. Thank you, Henry. Michael Dixon is standing up here. Michael's part of the First Friends program, so he'll keep in touch with you and be of help uh, any way that he can for you to find a place of ministry and growth and service here among us. Welcome. As you become part of this church, I ask you, do you reaffirm your faith in Christ? I do. And will you be loyal to the church and uphold it by your prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness? I will. Welcome Thank again you. to you. And welcome to you. Good to have you. Yeah. And uh, Brooks earlier had said to me a couple of days ago, when we were visiting about this service, that he has never had much luck in getting judges to do what he told them to do. <laughs> and so I guess I need to reiterate that we'd love for you to come down front, please, and give chance of, uh, folks a chance to greet you. And that goes also for the others he mentioned, our CPS friends and, and uh, process server and everyone, counselors. Yeah, come on down, stand up front. And so at the close of the service, people can greet you and, and thank you. And I want to add my thanks to all that you do. And, uh, and I also want to say uh, that as we're thinking about heroes today, as we're thinking about those angels, those people that Brooks was talking about, that we also include Brooks and his team at the Methodist Justice Ministry. Brooks, thank you. During the first service, as Brooks was preaching, I was thinking about, um, for, for some weird reason, I was thinking about the movie, It's a Wonderful Life. Uh, and actually, there's a good reason for that, because you remember the hero, if you will, of the movie is given the opportunity that most people will never have, and that is to see what the world would be like were it not for his existence. And I thought about that because Imagine what the world would be like for those 1,027 and the others that are in their sphere of influence and in our community were it not for the ministry of the Methodist Justice Ministry. And if we think about that and we think about all the needs that remain unfulfilled, then we are challenged, are we not, uh, to be supportive in every way with our prayers and with our resources, with our money. Uh, there is a tent, I mentioned it earlier, there's a tent out on the street. You can learn more about uh, Methodist Justice Ministry, and I encourage you to do that and also encourage your second mile giving to this important ministry because that's what makes it possible. The board has taken a step to hire another attorney, a third attorney, uh, who is uh, a, a young, you want to say just a word, Brooks? Say just a word about, about her so people are aware of that. Young woman, we've hired a young lawyer a graduate of Texas A&M Law School, a great school. Um, and she herself and her police officer husband have adopted three troubled children out of foster care. That is her heart. And she is exactly the kind of person that we want to join our ministry. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So thank you for being here. Thank you again for all you do and for being in this service with us today. Dr. Lamar Smith, who is the one who really works hard to bring people into membership of the church, would be happy to visit to each one of you who are not yet members. Right, Lamar? Right. Yeah, we would love to have you. But seriously, we do welcome you and glad you're with us today. Our gathering will soon be ended. Where will we go and what will we do? May grace, peace, hope, love, and joy forever accompany you. Amen.